Hey guys, Patrick here. Monday, May 2nd, 2022. How are you doing today? Wanted to make a quick video about what's happening today in the news. Uh, we've got um, Nancy Pelosi going visiting Zelensky over in Ukraine. So we have all this attention on Ukraine and Russia. And um, I wanted to bring up a, um, a tweet that I saw the other day. Somebody posted saying that Adam Kinzinger, Republic of Illinois, Republican representative, I guess, or representative of Illinois, is to introduce a joint resolution that would authorize, in quotes, the use of U.S. armed forces to defend Ukraine should Russia use chemical, biological, and or nuclear weapons. Did you get that? So Adam Kinzinger says he wants to introduce a joint resolution, I guess, both Democrat and Republican support that would authorize the use of U.S. armed forces to defend Ukraine should Russia use chemical, biological, and or nuclear weapons. That was the tweet. And somebody commented on that. That's not just a slippery slope to war. It's cliff diving. You could comment. Um, and so I've been following Gonzalo, Gonzalo Lira, his commentary on the conflict. And um, he's been pretty spot on for now. But of course, the information that we receive as the general public, there's always a, a layer of the, you know, the, the broad narrative. And then there's the secondary layer for the uh, people that want to dig deeper. And both layers are controlled. We know that. So whatever information that's trickling out, we know that that is information that's supplied anyway. So to know exactly what's going on is, is virtually impossible. We're fed the information that we receive. But Gonzalo has been calling for a false flag for some time, and um, he's been spot on so far. So if, if that's what it is, they want the world to believe that we're heading into World War III, World War III is already here, as a means to allow them to gain even more control of the population, more power for the state. And so whether there is a World War III or not a World War III, the effect will be the same. And that is control by the government to um, impose more control. There you go. But to see Pelosi coming out and saying that the, the U.S. is committed to supporting Ukraine until the fight is over, um, that's following exactly what um, Gonzalo has been talking about for some time. So if you haven't seen his video explaining the situation yet, I'll put a link in the comments um, of the video that he posted. And it's a good summary. It's a little bit long, but it's a great summary. So, um, and he's been calling for a false flag for some time. And this is following right along that playbook. The other thing I wanted to comment on, I was going to make a separate video about it, but I think it's something that's even more important, and that is um, the relationship between Muslims and Christians. Now, I know that's an insanely huge topic to try and deal with, and it's beyond the scope of a simple commentary or a simple video. I mean, I'd have to write a book about my beliefs. It would take me 50,000 words to try and present some type of reconciliation between fundamental Christianity and fundamental Islam. But Sam Harris, in his commentary, Letter to a Christian, he quotes two sections of scripture. He, he did an essay called Reply to a Christian, and he gives his reasons for being an atheist. He sets up a false dichotomy saying that you have to believe this or you have to believe that. He says you either have to be this or you have to be that. And of course he rejects both and he gives support for his reason to be uh, an atheist. And two verses that he quotes from the Quran, the first is 5, <clears throat> 71 to 75. I'm not sure the nomenclature that's used, but that's what he quotes. 5, 71 to 75, which talks about... Um, da, 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 da. The quote is, they have certainly disbelieved who say Allah is the Messiah, the Son of Mary. 
Well, the Messiah has said, O children of Israel, worship Allah, my Lord and your Lord. Now, when Christ rose from the dead, that was one thing that he said. He said, I'm going to my father your fa and your father. I'm going to my God. Remember when Mary touched me, said, don't touch me yet because I'm going to go to my father, your father. I'm going to my God and your God. And it's basically a, a quote, almost word for word, right? Saying that uh, in, in the Quran, it says, the Messiah said, O children of Israel, worship Allah, my Lord and your Lord. First of all, if we back up, if you've read the Quran, I've read the Quran, the term Allah refers to the God of the Old Testament. That's where we really have to start as a foundation. You have to recognize that Allah refers to the God of the Christians and the God of the Jews. Same God. It's God the Father. It's the all-powerful God. If you if you think that those two are different, then you're, you've gotten off on the wrong foot already. And you think, well, Allah is this different God that... No, the... The, the, the Quran has the same Bible stories that the Bible has, the Old Testament scriptures about Moses and etc., etc. So Allah is in reference to Almighty God, right? The all-powerful, all-forgiving, all-loving God. They use the term Allah. Christians use the same term. Jews use the same term. So you already have this synergy, if you want to call it that, or symmetry, if you want to call it that, as would be a better term, that... All three of those religions are trying to worship God, the Almighty God, right? Sometimes you can't even say his name because it's so holy, etc., etc. And um, and so it says, indeed, he who associates, continuing on the scripture that Sam Harris quotes, he who associates others with Allah, Allah has forbidden him paradise and his refuge is the fire. Well, this is a different statement altogether, a more powerful statement warning against associating others with Allah to say that Allah is this person or Allah is that person or Allah is a, a human person. And so, you know, this is where that misinterpretation comes from. Um, and then it c continues on. The second portion is uh, saying that they have certainly disbelieved who say Allah is the third of three. So a disputing against the Trinity concept. And there is no God except one God. And if they do not desist from what they're saying, they will surely afflict the disbelievers among them a painful punishment. So will they not repent to Allah and seek his forgiveness? And Allah is forgiving and merciful. That's a common theme in the Quran. Allah is all forgiving and merciful, merciful and forgiving. The Messiah, son of Mary, who was not but a messenger, other messengers have passed on before him, and his mother was a support of truth. They both used to eat food. Look how we make clear to them the signs, and look how they are deluded, blah, blah, blah. So... Anyway, um, it talks about um, rejecting the concept of one of three, which is a very important doctrine for Catholics, for example, the Trinity. But let's not worry about that. I'm just going to switch right over to the um, second passage that Sam Harris uses to argue that Muslims and Christians are in direct opposition to one another. And the second passage is from his uh, essay, uh, the Quran, 1930 to 38. And that says, is quoting, uh, Jesus said, indeed, I am the servant of Allah. He has given me the scripture and made me a prophet. And he has made me blessed wherever I am and has enjoined upon me prayer and zakah as long as I remain alive and made me dutiful to my mother. And he has not made me a wretched tyrant. And peace is on me, the day I was born, and the day I will die, and the day I am raised alive. That is Jesus, the Son of Mary, the word of truth about which they are in dispute. It is not befitting for Allah to take a son, exalted is he. When he decrees an affair, he only says it, be, and it is. Jesus said, and indeed, Allah is my Lord, and your Lord, so worship him. That is the straight path. Then the factions differed concerning Jesus from among them, so woe to those who disbelieved, from the scene of a tremendous day. How clearly they will hear and see the day they come to us, but the wrongdoers today are in clear error. Okay, so you can see that the scriptures from the Quran are in parallel to the scriptures from the New Testament. And the 
disputing between these two, you know, massive religions, major, major religions, can easily be attributed to individual specific interpretation. But the overall bigger picture between the two religions should be one of harmony and sympathy with one another, right? The Quran acknowledges Jesus, the son of Mary. The New Testament acknowledges Jesus, the son of Mary. Jesus said, you know, I'm going to my God and your God. And the Quran says the same thing. So why focus on the interpretations that would account for disagreement when you can focus on the scriptures that provide a synergy, that provide a, a, a harmony with one another? I think if more Christians read the Quran, they would understand that there is a lot more in common than there is differences. I'm going to leave it at that because, like I said, this is not a topic that you can spend five minutes on. You know, you'd have to spend hours and hours and hours going through all different rabbit holes to try and come to a conclusion. But just from my perspective, as an individual anecdotal experience, I'm saying that Sam Harris set up a false dichotomy and used that to argue, to reject both. And that's why he chooses to be an atheist. And I would simply argue that there is a lot in common and a huge amount more in common between those three religions than there is that should keep people separate from worshiping God, the Father. The same God for the, for the Jewish faith, the Christian faith, and the Muslim faith. They're trying to have peace with the same God through their specific scriptures. For the Jews, it's the Old Testament scriptures. For the Christians, it's the Old and New Testament scriptures. And for the Muslims, it is the Quran. And they're all pointing in the same direction to fear and obey God. And to, to, to the reason why there's value in religion is that it makes a person responsible to an all powerful deity. When there is no responsibility towards an afterlife. See, even Christ, when he said, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom was of this world, then my servants would fight for me so that I wouldn't be delivered. And yet at the same time, we are taught to pray, thy kingdom come. So this is the, the, the prayer that Christ taught his followers to pray. When you, when you pray, ask God for his kingdom to come to earth. So if we, can, we can sit back and say, well, my kingdom is not of this world because I'm only going to focus on the afterlife. I'm only going to focus on heaven. And so I'm not going to bother fighting in this life, fighting in quotes. But at the same time, we're instructed to try and bring God's kingdom to earth. And how does that happen? The only way to bring God's kingdom to earth is by acknowledging an all-powerful being to whom we are responsible and that applies to all religions, all religions that applies to. And that, I think, is the more important picture. We're going to have wars and rumors of wars, and we're going to have this and that. And our government is trying to return us to a, 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 a form of feudalism where there's an elite, and then everyone else is sort of basically kept in poverty and misery and controllable circumstances, if you want to call it that. And we can feel that. That's what's causing this agitation, that we, we feel that the, it's, it's the, the, the common folk against the, the elite government leaders who are obviously, you know, rules for them and not for everybody else. And we've seen the hypocrisy and all that kind of stuff. And it, it creates an uncomfortable agitation. We know that's happening. And it's always happened throughout history. That's been the case that, you know, governments have tried to manipulate the population to their own ends and to their own profits. And we see the corporatocracy rising in power, that these large corporations are able to lobby and influence to get their way so that their products are promoted, whether it be uh, consumable products or medical products or automobiles or this or that or the other thing. The, the corporate interests want to make profits and they influence the government. We see that. It, it's been like that for the last couple of hundred years since the Industrial Revolution. Of course, right? Profits is 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 ruling the world. And, and Christ did teach us that there is a ruler of this world that has nothing in common with, and the ruler in quotes, 
has nothing in common with somebody that acknowledges an all-powerful God and says, I am responsible to have to stand before that God someday. I am responsible that I have to stand before God and say, God, I'm sorry for the mistakes I made. I hope that you forgive me. And we basically are at his mercy, right? Because Christ said, the one you're supposed to fear is the one who's able to destroy both body and soul in hell. That's a fearful statement. Could you imagine that we are responsible to somebody who has the power to say, well, you know what? I don't like you. I'm going to send you to a, a, a flaming pit of fire for a gazillion years. <laughs> I mean, if that doesn't scare you to your soul, what will, right? What will? And to ever experience any type of, uh, how do I put this? If you've ever had a near-death experience where you felt like you may have been on the cusp of standing before God, then you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. And that is the most fearful position you could ever be in. The other thing that is fearful is to ever have the experience of facing pure evil, the ruler of this world, and to understand that there is absolutely no mercy, no mercy at all when you are faced with total evil that only wants to destroy you. So the experience of reading scriptures or even through nature, right? I'm just going to diverge for one second that Sam Harris also missed. And that is the scripture from Romans. It says, right, it says, who are you to judge the servant of another? To his own master he stands or falls, right? Now, in the context of this scripture, it's talking about eating bread and keeping one day important of another, right? Some people eat this and they don't eat that. And one person, you know, worships on the Saturday, another person on Sunday. That's the context of the verse. But if you look at that scripture itself, written by Paul, right? In his letter to the Romans, it says, to his own master he stands or falls, and he will stand for the Lord is able to make him stand. In other words, you know, if you take this and combine it with other scriptures from Romans, that, that the, the nature itself gives a testimony to God. This is why the common argument, well, if someone's never heard of Jesus, how are they going to get into heaven? Or if someone's never heard of this or that, or, or someone is following Buddha, or someone is following Muhammad, how are they able to get into heaven? God is able to, to make them stand according to the words of Paul right? Who spent a lot of time learning from Christ himself. And um, through the spirit. Okay, fine. I got to back up again. And simply to repeat, and I'll finish with this, simply to repeat that to be responsible to an all-powerful deity, you know, this is what gives us hope that we can become better people. This is what gives us hope that we can be born again, that we can have Christ live in us. If we open our hearts and say, God, please give me more of your Holy Spirit. We're asking for the Spirit of Christ to live through us so that we can treat our fellow human beings the way we would want to be treated, so that we can express love to one another, so that we can have peace with one another and not war, right? And not try and kill each other. Because this is so easily the 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 default position of a human being is Cain and Abel all over again. Whether it's the neighbor living next door to you, you pick up a rock and throw it at him. That's no different than two nations going at each other's throats and trying to wipe each other out with all these technological weapons that they have. So it appears we're moving towards conflict and that they want us to believe that there's a World War III going on to misdirect and, and to give reasons to to implement emergency measures. And because of the war that's going on, we have to ration this. And because of World War III that's going on, we have to not allow that. And because Ukraine and Russia are at war, we have to give money in this direction. Whatever the whatever that accomplishes for them, they're going to do what leaders do. We can look at it and say, that's what's going on in the world. But you know, be of good cheer because God has overcome the world. God is still in control and he controls the hearts and spirits of all of mankind. 
and he wants all of mankind to 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 survive and experience life and take you know Christ said he wanted want, the, the goal was to take many people to heaven to take many brothers and and sanctify many people through the testimony of these words he said i pray not only for them but for those that believe in their word so christ prayed for us he said i, I hope that that you believe because if he just appeared to us now, what, what would be our faith? Our faith is what saves us. If there's no faith, if there's there's no need to, to, to have a belief. See, Sam Harris doesn't get the, the value of faith. Sam Harris doesn't understand that there is value in believing something that is difficult to believe. That is the test of salvation. If it was just straightforward and Christ walked the earth and said, here I am, believe me. I'm, I'm, I'll put my hand on you and, and heal you of your disease. How hard would that be? It wouldn't be hard. But at the fullness of time, he came. And we are responsible to that testimony that survives to this day, whether it's through Jewish scriptures, Muslim scripture, Christian scripture, the testimony is the same or none of the scriptures. And the testimony is only through nature. Romans tells us that Nature itself is a testimony of the existence of God. So Sam Harris will not have an excuse. He will have to stand before God and the testimony of nature will reveal itself in his own heart and reveal to him that he should have believed. He should have believed and he didn't. He chose to disbelieve and he chose to try and stand on his own. And if he's able to stand more power to him if he's able to stand before God and, and, and God is able to tell him, well, you didn't believe in any religion, but you lived a good life and you did a good person. And because I have the power over your soul, I'm going to let you stand and go into heaven too, whatever the, the version of heaven that he's prepared for Sam Harris. And if that's the case, more power to him. Good luck with that, Sam. I hope it works out for you. But I'm not going to depend on that. I'm, I'm going to depend on on somebody atoning for my sin by believing in his death and resurrection, with which both, all three, attest to. The uh, uh, ancient scriptures of the Old Testament point towards Christ and Isaiah and other places, and the New Testament obviously points towards Christ and his death and resurrection for the salvation of humankind. Just got to read the Gospel of John or any of the Gospels for that matter. And the Quran also points towards Jesus, the son of Mary, and the prophet, and what he did to, to, to um, show us an example of salvation. Now, of course, they're interpreted in different ways between those three religions, but this is what I place my hope in, and that I say, God, you provided the way of salvation for me. You show me the way of salvation, and I accept the instructions in Scripture that you've given to me, and I believe in my heart that that's my hope for salvation and to live and act accordingly by following the instructions of Christ to love one another, to try not to, to, to hate my neighbor for no reason, right? So this is what uh, my hope is. And so, sorry I got off on a big tangent today, but I mean, how do you, how do you, how do you deal with these topics that we're dealing with today? They're huge, you know? War with Russia and war with Ukraine, and then somebody saying that atheism is the only viable option. And this is so popular today amongst intellectuals, the idea of atheism and the new atheists, Sam Harris, Christopher Hitchens, you know, the, um, the, um, the guy who did the, the, the book with, um, I'm trying to think of his name, Dawkins. He, he really was the foundational Richard Dawkins. I've read all their books, Richard Dawkins, both his, his, um, his books, and I've read Yuval Harari's books, which are basically uh, uh, Sapiens and uh, Homo Deus. Both those books are basically, uh, um, how would I describe them? They are a presentation of atheism. That's what they are. The, the purpose behind Yuval Harari's books is to support atheism. They are anti-Christian books and 
the only reason I would recommend reading them is to know what not to believe in, right? Because they will, they will, they will shake your faith. They will try and get you to abandon any religious belief at all in anything. And and uh, uh, you know, Richard Dawkins took it to an extreme, and they have absolutely no foundation. They depend upon putting faith in nothingness. They put on they they fundamentally they try and get you to put your faith in something coming from nothing that's where they end up they're trying to chase their tail and they fail miserably but because they are wordsmiths because they are so eloquent in the way that they're able to manipulate words on a page they have convinced thousands perhaps even millions of people to abandon their faith and we are experiencing the result of that today in our leadership at all levels. Leadership within the corporate world that is greed at all costs. Leadership in the entertainment world, which is pleasure and hedonism at all costs. Leadership in the political world that is power at all costs over others. And again, corruption and greed because they have abandoned the idea that we are responsible to our creator, that we are responsible to the all-powerful God of all the world's religions who knows our hearts, who knows us inside and out. This is the state that we're in. And the battle that we should be fighting is not a battle of political battle. This is why there's no point in whether I'm going to run as a candidate or not. There's no point for that. The more important battle is the battle for people's souls, that they would return to God and repent and say, God, I need your help. I look at my own life and I decided, my wife and I have decided to go live with the Mennonites basically. And I've decided not to run in the upcoming election because I'm thinking to myself, what is the point? There is no point. The most valuable thing is for me to try and encourage people towards a faith in God, because that is the foundation for everything else. That is the foundation for my prosperity. Do I deserve to have become prosperous in my life based on my own efforts? Absolutely not. I've seen people that have more talent than me, more skills than me, more education than me. I remember hearing of a friend of a friend who became a, a, a surgeon after many years of study and ended up going bankrupt because of malpractice issues that he had in the United States. A horrible, horrible story. And he wasn't able to continue in his career that he spent like 10 years studying. Is that because of he didn't have the talent? No, but when God wants to get your attention, he knows how to do it. It's my point, right? And God has blessed me and prospered me. Yeah, I've stumbled along the way and I've had a lot of, you know, mistakes and failures and who who hasn't as part of the life experience of course but at, I'm as I approach the end of my life now I'm reaching the the twilight years of my life I'm looking back and saying God has been so kind to me so merciful to me in spite of my own weaknesses and propensity to make bad stupid decisions that he has rescued me from myself and this has always been my prayer God rescue me from myself Fill me with your Holy Spirit so that I have more of the Spirit of Christ so that I don't do stupid things. When I invite the Spirit of Christ into me, it's as if God is saying, okay, well, how, how, is, how am I going to live through this human being? We open ourselves up to being accountable to an all-powerful God. And I think this is the, the struggle that I want to focus on, the struggle of self-mastery, the struggle of trying to love my neighbor a little better, than I did the day before and not focus so much on all this political stuff because I'm just as weak as anybody and I've got caught up in all this political stuff and I've said, well, we've got to get more candidates and we've got to do this and we've got to run for office and we've got to do that and that. And at the end of the day, I look back and I say, you know what? God's in control, man. What's the point? God's in control. And if he wants to raise up leaders, he's going to do it. But I want to make sure that I don't lose sight of the more important battle, which is the battle for my soul and the battle 
for the souls of humanity, that we as a collective community, that we acknowledge God and ask for his mercy so that we don't kill each other. That's the hope for humanity, is a God that will work with us and keep us from killing each other. That's, that's our hope, right? If we think that we can do it on our own, like Yuval Harari, and hack into the human genome and create new life through AI and this powerful new world and fly to Mars and do all this stuff and, and expand human civilization and say, oh, we've done it ourselves. We've created a new, better human and blah, 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 blah. I say, good luck with that. I don't see it. Imagine what people experienced during World War II. They thought the world was coming to an end when the, when the nuclear bombs went off. And if, and if nuclear bombs start going off again, people are going to be fearful again. They're going to think that's it. We've destroyed ourselves. And they'll be forced to turn back to God. Why don't we turn back to God now ahead of time and say, God, have mercy on us. Raise up ethical leaders who respect you in our, in our countries so that we would know how to teach the next generation, so that we would know how to have valuable, strong citizens who care about each other and want to have good community together and are not influenced by lies and deception and greed and killing. That's our only hope. We need to ask God to rescue us from ourselves. Whether Whatever religion you follow, if you agree with me, give me a thumbs up. Let me know because, uh, I mean, you know, I studied comparative religions in, in school. I studied philosophy in school. That was one of the courses I had to take. I'm not an idiot, but, you know, I still have a lot to learn. And I hope I can continue learning before I leave the earth. But from what I've learned so far, this to me is a more pressing solution than a political solution. It's a more pressing solution than a military solution. It's a more pressing solution than an economic solution. When you have your spirit life in order, the economic solution becomes obvious because then you make the right decisions. You're like, wow, this was easy. You know, wow, that wasn't so hard. And then you prosper and you, you think, wow, Jeremiah 29, God has plans to prosper me. He wasn't kidding. Wow, isn't that amazing? I, did, I don't deserve it. You know, I've been retired for 10 years and God's continuing to prosper me every year after the next. It's like, how does that work? Glory to God. I thank him for his mercy towards me and I pray that he's been merciful to you as well. Thank you for watching. Boy, I went on a lot longer than I thought it would, but thank you for listening God bless you. I hope you have a fantastic day. I don't know when I'm going to make my next video, but um, I'm going to post this online. And if um, something up comes tomorrow, I'll make another video. Why not? <laughs> I got to do something, right? I'm retired. I have a little bit of time on my hands. Now I'm going to go get some fresh air and go for a walk. God bless you. I love you. Thank you for watching. Have a great day. Bye-bye now. Take care.